Hello, droughts, floods. Do they ever get you thinking? When a climate scientist or meteorologist declares a year or a period as a drought period or as a wet period, what are your reactions? Do you get perplexed? Do you get astonished? Are you excited? Do you want to know more about it? Do you ever ask questions about how these metrics are computed? What goes into their computation, its implementation, also its explanation? Do you even want to attempt to produce some of these metrics on your own? If this and many are your questions, then you are in the right place. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. So if any new content comes up, you will be the first to be notified and also share with your network, share with people in your network, let them know what's happening here. Let's build a greater community together. And so in today's episode, what we look at is the rainfall anomaly index. And there's another metric that's being used for classification of drought years or drought periods, and then also flood periods. And I would leave the script in the GitHub repository. You can always find that there. The link is attached here. So when we talk of rainfall anomaly index, this has been in the system for quite a while. And first um, implemented by Roy. And so what we're doing here is we try to first identify anomalies. And based on the anomalies, we have various computations that either for the positive anomalies and then also for the negative anomalies. This has been explained in detail. All right, so in this, what we pick out is our N being the, you know, within the period of observation, the, um, I mean, the rainfall itself that would be using computer anomaly. So the N up here, it represents the rainfall for each um, period, or let's say each time step within the period we are looking at. And then the N bar represents the mean over that period as a climatological information. So we subtract that from each series and we get the anomalies. And depending on the anomalies, be it positive or negative, we have either M bar or X bar. Now M bar in this case will be for the highest 10. So we rank the various precipitation indices and then we pick the highest 10 and find the average for the highest 10. And that becomes the M bar. And for the lowest 10, that becomes the X bar. So for the negative anomalies, we use the X bar and we subtract also the climatology from the X bar and that becomes a divisor. For the positive anomalies, we find the difference between the climatology and the 10 highest. Now in other studies, instead of using the 10 highest values or the 10 lowest values, some employ the percentile values. So finding the 10th percentile and then the values below the 10th percentile are just summed as the X bar. And then they find the 90th percentile and then the ones above the 90th percentile are the M bar. Now we are going to look at how to do this in different ways. And beyond that, we have various classification that um, is attributed to, you know, the various rainfall anomaly indices that we see um, being a humid period, dry period, and so on and so forth. And so to start it all off, then again, I repeat the GitHub repository just for um, a quick reminder that this will be uploaded there. So we import our packages. First, we import XRE, and then I make use of, okay, well, I didn't really use this, so we can actually skip that. But then I've explained what the path lib does and why we import the path that allows us to simply make use of um, terminal-based um, sort of path or file finders just as we do on the terminal. It makes us easily do that here. I didn't do that here because I'm working with my script directly in the same location as where my data file is. And so then again, I import warnings and then make use of the ignore attribute of the filter warnings just to prevent the page to be flooded. I mean, the page would have been flooded with a lot of warnings if I probably use the command that was going to be obsolete or a bit had a bit of, you know, um, warnings attached to it that would have flooded the page. So we use this to ignore the warnings. And then again, get to know that warnings are not the same as errors. So warnings are just indications of what possible um, future upgrades of the package would be omitting or some things that would be going obsolete and so on and so forth. All right. So after importing XRE, we then import, we, we actually get our data sets imported or read out 
using the open data set. I'm using the crew time series 4.03 again from 1901 to 2018. So from 1901 to 2018 precipitation data set, I read that as data. And then now there's definitely going to be a data set. So now I read the data array of precipitation from the data set. Okay. Now we come to the key aspect, which is building the function. And so what we have in here is I define the function and the DS here will be the data set, which will be the net CD of data sets I'm using. And then I pass in here dimension, which allows us to specify what dimension to work on. So if I have in this case, for instance, I'll be using mostly the time component. So if it's defined, the coordinates or the dimensions defined as time, I just pass in time. If I employ a group by, which changes it from a time to say year, then it means I pass in year and that becomes easy. And then I also brought in here method and define the default as ordinary. Now I'll explain this in these, or probably let me just explain. So ordinary in the sense that I'm making use of two different approaches. So one being the ordinary method, that's where we pick the 10 highest for the maximum or the positive, and then the 10, um, 10 lowest values for the minimum or the negatives. And then the other up, um, alternative or the other approach is using a percentile approach. And so we would look at how to implement all those here. And so the very first thing we need is our climatology. So we find the mean of the data set, that's our DS we are passing in here. And we find the mean over the dimension we specify. So depending on what dimension I specify this time, it's gonna be the mean over time. And then we subtract the mean from the data set to give us the anomalies, all right. Now, beyond that, now we come to the next step. So if I'm gonna use the percentile method, um, in order not to have any restrictions, all I needed was to be sure that, okay, well, the method that a person passes in is percentile. Okay, so once we have, say, if the method dot lower is percentile, that means whatever you pass in there would be put in a lower case and compared to see if it really matches with percentile. If that's the case, then it means for the lower threshold, that's the minimum points, we apply the non-percentile approach using the reduce function, which I'll again attach the link to the video, the tutorial video on how to make use of a reduce function so that you can look at that if you haven't watched that already. So here's a non-percentile passing here, our 10th percentile, and then along the dimension that we specified. And then we also get the upper thresholds or the upper values using the same nine percentile, this time setting the 90th percentile. And when we are done, now we come to getting all the low values. And so we pick from the data sets where the data sets are less than the 10th percentile. And we find the average of them on the dimension we specify. We do same for the higher where the DS is greater than the 19th percent, the 90th percentile, find the average over the dimension. And so with the percentile approach, this is how we'll get the X bar and then the M bar, which is as stated here, the M bar and then the X bar. And then the other alternative, if the person or the user just enters ordinary, then it means we are gonna sort out the data. So first we use the same reduce function. We sort out the data from, I mean, that's by using NP, that's NumPy. So, yeah, so we need to import, then again, add an importation of NumPy here. So we import NumPy as NP, which is a numerical Python package. Okay, so now we employ the np.sort method and we sort along the dimension. So if the dimension is time, it sorts all the grids over the time. And then it does same for the upper, right? I mean, virtually. Uh, well, in this case, it's, there would have been no need for this because, well, I, I'm just sorting and I can start in the next phase, you see what we did to give us the upper part and the lower part. So this wouldn't really be necessary. We can just call this, um, say, trash, and then make use of trash instead. All right. So for the lower end, we pick the trash from the first point to the 10th element. So if it's 10 elements, that's the first 10 elements, like zero to nine, that'll be okay. And then it finds the mean along the dimension we specify. And then when we apply the reverse approach, so if I start from the beginning, 
So we're about negative 10. That means as we go in a reverse order in steps of negative ones, we'll be reducing in that step. That means we'll give us the far end, which has the which in this case will be the higher point, the 10 higher values, and then find the mean along the same dimension. Now for a clearer view of this, let's say we have um let's just define A and I make use of say MPA range um 20. So I find just 20 elements. All right. So now if I print out A, you see how the output is. So A say to 10 will be A0 to 9, which is a 10 elements. So if you number them, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten elements. Now, if I want to get the reverse like I did, if I try to use just this, just the starting and then to negative 10, it will just pick the starting and then we'll still be moving in the forward approach till it gets to the negative 10th value, which is like in the reverse order, what the value would have been the negative 10. And so it moves back to the same point again. But then if I want to get the values in the reverse, that's picking the highest points, then it means I'm going to have a step of negative one. That means it should rather be in a decreasing step. So we would move backwards. And that produces the far ends. So we have 19, 18, on and on and on to 11. And that's exactly what we've done in here with the sorting to give us the upper threshold. That's when we are using the ordinary method. OK. And then we just pass in this. Um, final L statement to indicate that, I mean, the wrong selection was made. Now, once we are done with that, okay, well, initially I was using this, there's no need to have this arbitrary dead. Okay, so now we can compute the negative ends and then also the positive ends. Now the negative is just the negative three times. We pick all the anomalies where the anomalies are negatives. Okay, so we pick all those and then that would have dropped all the positives or the zeros takes only the negatives and then divides by the, the low values we got um, with a subtraction of the climatology from that low values. And then that gives us the negatives aspect alone. And then for the positives, we multiply three by the positive anomalies alone divided by a subtraction of the high points and then the climatology. Now, when we are done, these are producing negatives and positives. Now we want to fit them in together. So what we did is to call the anomalies and then wherever the anomalies are greater or equal to zero, which is the positive ones, those are kept, all right? The positives are kept and then where it's negatives, it gets replaced with the negatives computation we did. Okay, so the negatives computation we performed would overwrite all the negative values in the anomalies. And then when we are done, we still maintain that come back and then pick the same anomalies, all right? That were negative before, we sort of keep them and then where the positives are replaced with the positives. And this whole new item is not written back to anomalies, written into a new variable called the RAI, representing the rainfall anomaly index, and we return the RAI. And so once we are done, we can, that's our function, we can then implement that. So I slice the data set for a particular longitude and latitude, Right. And after slicing the data set on that grid, the longitude and latitude, we can then compute the, um, the rainfall anomaly index. Now, um, to make this quite easier for me, I also did a goodbye of time dot year and then found the sum on the time. So there's more like annual totals that I'm performing the anomaly index on. And so I can pass in this place, like we did for the function, the function we built, we said the function name, the data we are working on, we indicate the dimension to compute on. Now, this dimension is the year. And then the method, the method can be percentile or ordinary, just as we specified. So I can pass in here, percentile, get to run that. And so we have this new variable, that's DA underscore REI, containing the information we need, right? And so, I mean, by default, it uses the same variable name. We can change the variable name. Yeah, if you want to. All right, so now I call the DA underscore REI, that's the data array, REI, and then I can pick any year from it, making use of the cell method. But then bear in mind that when we type in here DA underscore REI, 
the time component had changed, the dimension of time has changed to a year because we did a yearly summation, all right? So there's one way XRE deals with the group bikes. And then we have the various years from 1901 to, I mean, 1901, that's 19, yeah, <laughs> sorry, with all the mixes in there. So 19, that's the early part of the, ninth, I mean, 1901, yeah, that's it, to 2018. And so we can pick any of them and then just visualize. So we select, for instance, 1999 and we plot. And we can set our maximum if we want to or minimum if we want to. And the color map I'm using just red and blue. That's red for the dry periods and then blue for the wet periods. So we plot this out and this is what we get for say 1999. Um, I think we can try say maybe say um, 2009. And then there's the output in 2009. Okay. Now, if you want, you can also um, not restrict your VMAX so that you use the actual maximum and minimum. All right. Then in this part, I just selected for a point location. So using um, a point longitude point, I mean, point location, that's one longitude, one latitude, and then employing the method nearest so that if it's not directly found, it takes the closest point to it and then plot that. And then we can see the warm, I mean, the very dry years, I mean, the dry years below the zero mark, and then the moist years or the humid years above the zero mark. Um, then again, if you've not seen a very first tutorial on how to pick um, or identify or select just a point location or a particular area, I'd attach the link to the description and you can find that for your viewing. You can go watch it. And we can also find the um, mean of all the areas over the years and plot them out. And this is what we get. Generally, we see from this, it's so clear that um, most parts of West Africa are just getting, or let's say, have been drying out. Okay, they've been drier over the period. That's the early period to 20. 18, as we have in this, I mean, pair this data set. And similarly, we can find the average over the, over all the longitudes and latitudes, and we plot them, we get a time series in this case, just as we have down here. And that would be it for the rainfall anomaly index. Um, if you have any question, don't hesitate to ask in the comment section, and then the team would address it. Like I said, we'll upload this script in the GitHub page so you can always get it, try your hands on it. You can use any data set of your choice. I mean, all you need to do is to change your data name. That's it. And that should be able to work. Um, if you're new here, like I said, don't forget to subscribe, turn on post notifications so you are notified whenever we have any new content uploaded. And kindly share within your network. Let's take this bigger and better and let's help others also to learn the basics of Python, how to apply it in our various, you know, fields of work and operation. And like I always say, just keep a positive attitude and it's going to be better. I mean, you can never go wrong learning Python. Do have a wonderful time and hope to see you again in the next tutorial. Bye-bye.